Hello, good afternoon everybody. Um, it's always great to do the session straight after afternoon tea when everybody's wrapping everything up, but we'll um, see if we can keep this a bit lively. No? Yes. No? Yes? Okay, cool. No, 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 we're good. I was going to read from that, but I'm a little bit... Can I move this to... Or is that going to change that? No. Um, I only just wrote this, so I don't know what's on the slides yet. Yep. It's not going to change that? Cool. I mean, I can just do that way. Or if you click it, it will work. Okay, okay, sorry. Sorry about that, technology's great. Okay, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank all the presenters. It's been a, um, a really stimulating and educating day for me. Um, I think you've all done an amazing job and um, thanks to the organisers for organising this and getting such a nice variety of, of talks here. Um, I also wanted to thank the organisers for the opportunity, well I was going to thank the organisers for the opportunity of standing here and doing this summary presentation, but I feel, yes, um, a little bit challenged and intimidated doing it now. Um, as I know half of you in the room and you all know that I'm not a bird expert, that's for sure, and most of you are, um, and I have great respect for you all. So. Um, I guess I just put that little caveat out there first, that I'm not the bird expert in the room, most definitely. Um, but I will try and give you my, I guess, my thoughts and opinions on, on the things that we've heard here today. Um, on that, for the people that don't know me, I do work for the department, the government, um, the Department of <laughs> Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. And yes, we love our new name. Um, and um, my role is my role is principal zoologist, and basically my role is about, I guess, providing strategic advice and direction um, on all fauna, threatened fauna, all fauna actually in Western Australia. So as you can see, it's it's a it's a role which um, I guess I have to know a little bit about everything, and therefore I'm not an expert on anything. But what I do strongly rely on is the amazing work that other people do, and I think that work was demonstrated so well here today and I'm really grateful for being invited and being here and getting to hear about all the wonderful things that are happening um, on the bird front uh, here in Western Australia and beyond. Okay. okay, so I've been asked to give a bit of a summary um, and this was, yes, this was difficult, challenging as I said, um, but our first session was about the role of citizen science um, and community. Um, with Nick and Plaxi and Adam and Simon, and I thank you all for those those wonderful presentations. Um, what I got out of that was that there was some amazingly complex issues that were being tackled really well in that citizen science sort of realm. And maybe I shouldn't call it citizen science. Where's Keith? What should I call it instead? Just just science. science. Just science. Okay, sorry. Um, and there were some really innovative approaches, and you know, great examples of of amazing things that were happening in that sort of field. Um, to me, it demonstrated the ability for the community, you know, to contribute to science in a, in a really meaningful way. And I applaud the bird community for doing that because I think you do it better than any other, you know, group of, of animals that we have to look after. It is, is actually a really unique situation. Um, it showed me that it not only has the ability to provide data and information to support management, but it had a dual benefit of also um, raising awareness and, and engaging people and you know, putting those two things together is, is no mean feat and I think I applaud you know, the work and I know that was only a, a section of some of the, the, the work that's going, out, going on in that space. Um, one of the things that did um, hit me was that there still is really, there's still a need for some sort of support mechanisms for them. Although it relies very heavily often on volunteers, you still need money and funding keep things going. I think it was something Plaxi put up about um, the difference with the, the 2020 when the Shorebird 2020 when they had funding compared to when they didn't um, and even just a small amount of funding helps to, to pull that together. So I don't think we can you know say we can just rely on community and citizen science to do all the work. Um, it, it still needs support and funding. Um, and I think it still needs some clearer mechanisms for information to get to management and to influence and, um, management decisions. There were some great examples there where that was happening, but I think we can, we can keep building on that. Okay, and then we had a session on working to prevent extinctions, and that was Lyndall and Sarah, Saul, Simon and Robin, and again, an amazing array of, of presentations. To me, they were really excellent examples of on-ground actions um, and projects that were going on. And it was a nice cross-section of things. I know there's a lot more going on out there. Um, it was some really, some high risk and some high profile and some challenging things in there, which was really, really exciting to see. 
Um, but for me, it really brought home that the real importance of, of research in all stages of, of recovering birds. Um, and so research was so important in, um, in our decision making and having that research and that information sharing um, based on science was really important. Um, I'm really excited about new innovations and new technologies and hope that it can help us to do these things more effectively and more efficiently, um, but that brings new challenges as well. Um, but it, and again, I, I was sort of a bit struck, I suppose, at times of the problems of of getting that information still into management. I mean, the um, I think the fire stuff with the um, the Triodia burning stuff over east was a really interesting example of, of how that can happen. Um, for me, a way of doing that though, and it was one of the shining examples, I think, is recovery teams and the role of recovery teams in doing those things. And um, Sarah really brought that home. I, I admit, I am actually on that recovery team, so I get to say that it was um, really good, but yeah, it's got nothing to do with me being on it that makes it really good. It's been operating for so long and it's, it is, I'm on about 20 recovery teams, but you know, that is one of the most effective ones that I, I am on and, um, and I think they should be really proud of what they do. Um, the Book of Hope was mentioned a couple of times and I actually wrote a couple of chapters on that and went to the workshop that was about it um, because of my <laughs> um, love for recovery teams. Um, but it really did, oh, again, the, the two chapters I wrote were about recovery teams, you know, two, more, two other species where recovery teams are really important. So I do really think that framework is, is amazing to bring some information together. Um, and something Sarah said really resonated with me as to why that recovery team particularly works well. And I think she said something about that the members are collaborating. They're not just stakeholders that are at the table to tell people what they're doing. It's actually about them working together, collaborating, um, delivering projects and, and, and everybody bringing, bringing something to the table. Um, and I think that's, that's the way a recovery team really needs to work. At that point, at the end of that session, I was like bipolar because I was like, oh my God, I, I'm a scientist and I always thought science, research, that's the way we've got to go and we've got to do this sort of stuff. But then, you know, there's the citizen science stuff, the community engagement, the community awareness stuff, that was blowing my mind and I'm like, oh my God, you know, which one's more important? And then of course, duh, the third session came along and showed me that it's all actually important and it actually all needs to blend together. So one is not more important than the other, both are important. But what the challenge is, is that we've got to bring them together and we've got to, um, we've got to get them working together really well. And so Tegan, um, Jamie and Abraham, um, David and Keith um, really brought that home for me. There was great demonstrations there where, um, where um, science and community and, and um, traditional knowledge and, you know, um, was, was all coming together and delivering really amazing things um, for conservation of birds. Um, and so, you know, I didn't have to be bipolar anymore. I worked out that they actually need to bring the whole lot together. Um, and again, there were some great examples of that. It's about, you know, harnessing community and volunteers, you know, those amazing ranger groups and um, traditional knowledge and the science, doing it with a science framework, making sure that information is shared and, and, and can get to managers to make decisions. Um, and it's easy, that's all we've got to do. Okay, so, but. Again, there, I still feel like there's more we can do about the data sharing and, the, and, the, and getting that knowledge into management, into that decision making um, processes. Um, that's lacking um, across the board, um, but it's really difficult, so um, that's why it's lacking, and not only in the bird, bird stuff. So they asked me to talk about what was working well and what are the gaps and so forth. Um, and this is coming from my perspective in my role. As I said before, I, you know, I work in government and um, for me, I, you know, I draw on all of this information to try and make decisions and try and influence um, decision making. Um, but what's working well, obviously, is the profile of birds. You know, birds are accessible and people will see them and people can work with them and they're high profile and they can be a flagship for other species and they connect people to nature. You know, they've got all this really great stuff going for them and, and we need to capitalise on that. I really love in the bottom corner of the bird life um, presentations that said birds are in our nature and I think that's a that's a fantastic um, saying and I'm going to adopt it from now on um, that um, but that's right I mean birds present a fantastic opportunity to to bring people together and to get people engaged with nature and connected back to nature again um, and we need to capitalize on that um, I think today showed that there are ex excellent examples of where the bird community, and I say that broadly, the bird community, including research, science, community, um, traditional owners, etc., really are showing the way as to how we can actually work together. 
and how we can, um, um, I guess, capitalise on that variety of skills and knowledge that we have from these different sort of areas um, to deliver for conservation for threatened species. Um, I think the variety of approaches, it really works. Amazingly enough, I sound surprised, but um, I guess you know, coming from being a scientist and always having that paradigm of you know research and, and academia is that what I've, what I've noticed is there's there's a whole heap of other tools and ways of doing this out there, and, and it's really working in this in the bird community, and I think um, that's working well, and we should make sure we capitalise and embrace that. Um, the cooperation thing, I think frameworks like the recovery teams are really important and that we need to build on those sorts of things and they can work really well. Um, and the role and effectiveness of advocacy came home to me as well in terms of um, if we don't have, have that happening, then you know we're, we're sort of fighting a bit of a losing battle. So there's a great variety of, um, of skills and experience that needs to come to the table. Where the gaps? Well, the first one's pretty bloody obvious. Um, threatened species conservation resources are a little bit lacking at this point in time. Um, and that's across the board, that's across Australia. I recently went to a meeting of threatened species managers from states all across Australia and we all had the same, except New South Wales, they're rolling in money. The rest of us are just, you know, stripped bare. Um, and this is government agencies. Um, and I know, you know, that's reflected across the board. There's not enough resources, there's not enough money to do threatened species conservation at the moment. Um, and so it's hard work and it's really hard work for all those passionate people out there trying to do really good things. Um, but what it does mean, instead of standing here whinging about it, um, that we actually need to direct those scarce resources into um, to prioritise our actions, identify and agree on where we need to go and how to direct those resources. Um, because if we don't do that, we'll waste money and we'll, you know, we'll waste opportunities. So um, it's working together. Um, unfortunately, where I work, from where I sit, I still see and experience silos. You know, we are still separate groups and it, it even strikes me sometimes as money tightens up that people actually end up getting more competitive when we start competing with each other for the dollar. And, um, and that's, that's, you know, that's not productive. Um, and I really hope that we can break down those silos and work together and continue to work together um, and, and you know, work, as, work as one rather than separating ourselves into governments and NGOs and, and other groups. Um, I think we still need to improve on that knowledge and data sharing. That's an ongoing challenge we'll keep working on. And we need to get the information and the knowledge from these projects into the decision makers <coughs> like the government, um, but also other land managers and other decision makers. So I think we nearly need to work on those things as well. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about today because this was about threatened species conservation but something that takes up a huge amount of my time in terms of birds is some of the negative human bird interactions particularly around Perth um, and effective management of overabundant species is, is an ongoing issue that we will need to um, try to work on. It's, it's funny that it's, it's quite hard to get people to work on doing the negative management of things rather than the, than the positive recovery but um, it's still an issue. So in conclusion, I think um, what I think is the opportunities or the main messages here is um, collaboration, 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 of course. Um, many people talked about collaboration and I really think that that's what we've got to do. We've got to work together. Um, I think Keith said, thank you, Keith said it's um, collaborations about respect, trust and fun. I think, did I quote you right, Keith? Yes, okay. So we gotta do more of that. I personally am gonna take on the mantra of having more fun. So the rest of you can do the trust and respect thing, okay. Um, but no, we do need to collaborate. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious from some of the projects in this room what amazing things can happen when people do collaborate and where we share our skills and our knowledge um, and, and that's just gotta continue. Um, embrace the diversity of approaches. You know, I gotta, we got to get away from saying we can only do it this way or we can only do it that way. This is, there's obviously a great variety of ways of doing anything um, and it's demonstrated today that, that they work and that we need to embrace them and bring them together and, and support each other in doing them. Um, we need to use our variety of skills, experience and influence, um, uh, I guess, together collaboratively. Um, harness the people power that's out there, it is there, um, but it's got to blend with science and it's got to be delivered in a scientific framework so that people like me can use it to, for decision making and to defend you know, things that are coming at us left, right and centre. Um, you know, we get a lot of pressure, you know, in my role I get a lot of pressure and the thing that is most useful to me is to have some data or to have some science to back that up. 
um, you know, the community awareness and the community pressure and the advocacy is, is fantastic, but, you know, it really comes down to it. If I've got data and I've got science to back up decision making, then, you know, that's where the power is from where I sit. Um, engagement, awareness, sharing, we need to keep doing that. Um, and of course, I think we all need to play a role in, in advocacy um, and building the profile of threatened species, um, birds and those other things, mammals and reptiles and stuff as well. But let's just talk about birds today. I thank all the people that uh, gave me photos to use because I'm a terrible photographer as well. Um, I'd like to thank you guys all for coming today. The organisers, especially Beck, amazing job. Thank you very much. And anybody else I missed out on. So thank you. <laughs>